God is Love is a powerful song given to us from a powerful passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter 4. And I'm also thankful we sang Amazing Grace. All of those, you know, when it comes to grace, when it comes to love, we wouldn't have grace without the love of God. We wouldn't have love without grace. Recognizing that there is balance there. But the question behind me though, balance is also important. How do we deal with guilt? We're going to deal with guilt this morning in a two-part lesson. This lesson will be the first part. We will finish up tonight. And with that, I ask you to write down Romans chapter 7, verse 21 through chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to be looking at that tonight. This lesson came from a discussion after our sermon last week. Having a discussion concerning the balance between grace and guilt. What is the balance? And this came from our discussion in Matthew chapter 25 as we were looking at the parable of the talents. So I'd like for us to go back to Matthew 25 very quickly and, and look at the balance between grace and guilt. We find grace in verses 21 through 23. And just, a, just a, a summary, we recognize that this parable is like the kingdom of heaven and that this was an owner, a master of a house that gives his property, divides up his property between three of his servants. One he gave five talents, another two, another one. All three immediately got to work. The first two got to work in trading to make a profit. In fact, they were able to make five, the five talent man made five talents more, the two talent man made two talents more. But I find it interesting the response is when the master of the house went away for a long period of time and he came back and he settled accounts. Look at the response of the master in verse 21 to the five talent man. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here. I have made two talents more. His master responded in the same way. You have been faithful over a little. You know, that's when the, the five-talent man could have said, Hey, wait a second. You said that I was faithful over a little, but I was faithful over more than the two-talent man. He could have responded in that way. This is not fair. No, this is grace. This is the concept of grace. None of us can earn our spot in heaven. Amen. None of us can do enough to earn our place in entering into the joy of our Master. And so we've got to stop and recognize that. And in fact, we could look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and that was a passage that was mentioned last week, and that that you know, our reward is not based on our works, lest any should boast. But we are His workmanship. We are created, verse 10, in Christ Jesus for good works. We work because we are saved. We are not working to be saved. And so that is a balance that is very hard for us to make. And I could say that very, very simply, but there's a lot of depth to that statement. And so we recognize that there is grace in the fact that each was given according to his ability, those talents. You recognize the one talent man, I mentioned that he got to work, and you might say, wait, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. He went to work digging and burying the talent that Jesus gave him. But if you think about it, if he had gotten to work and, and immediately started to trade to make a profit, and he gave one talent more, he would have heard the same thing. You, you have been faithful over a little. I will place you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. But because he responded in wickedness and laziness to, to the commission that he'd been given, we have verse 30. Verse 30 says, And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. We have grace in verses 21 through 23, but we have guilt in verse 30. So there's got to be a balance between these two. And, and in fact, as we were having this discussion last week, someone came up and, 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 and I just mentioned we're discussing the balance between grace and guilt. And, and the response was, one is from God, and the other is from Satan. And you know, when I, I stop and I think about that, that is a perspective, that is an answer. But there is so much more to it as far as the balance when it comes to guilt, how we deal with it. But I'd like to begin where that statement was. Guilt is from Satan. Because he's a manipulator. And he uses guilt to manipulate, and we know that from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. In fact, Satan laid on the guilt with God in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is a passage that we have gone through so many times, and, but I've really not stopped to look at what he's actually saying concerning God here. If you will, let's look at verse 1 beginning. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts at the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So we, we've stopped, we, we look at that, and we, we see the response to, to Eve from Satan. It says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. So often I stop there and I recognize, Wait, Satan is lying. He has taken the one law, the one command, and he's flipped it upside down. And he is he has tempted Eve. And we just kind of go on from there and we look at the response from, from Eve and she sees that it's a fruit that's desired, the delight to the eyes and the desire to make one wise. Why is it a desire to make one wise? Because of verse 5. Sir, the serpent goes on and it says, not just that he, he's saying you will not surely die, the bold-faced lie, but verse 5 he says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He is, he is telling Eve the reason that God doesn't want you to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not that you're going to die. The reason is He doesn't want you to be like Him. He's trying to hide this from you. He doesn't want you to be equal with Him. And literally, He is laying on the guilt concerning God. He is saying God is hiding this from you so that you can't be the best form of you. He is laying on the guilt concerning God. He's saying God is guilty. Satan does that. Satan lays on the guilt to manipulate and he was able to manipulate the fall of man. But God has still spoken and the punishment was made because God had already said if they ate of it, they would die. And that was said. Well, what about Matthew chapter 4? How did Satan use guilt when he was talking to Jesus? You know, I, I find it interesting. Uh, you know, that's actually what the one talent man did, by the way, when it comes to guilt, laying on the guilt. Instead of of getting up and working, what did he do? He took the great commission that he'd been given and he said to the Master, I knew that you were a hard man. You reap where you didn't sow, you gather where you cast no seed. So I just went and I, I buried the talent. Here, here's what's yours. You see, he guilted the Master. He turned it back on the Master so that he didn't have to do anything. And in fact, we understand that in that parable, that is a story that is going alongside reality and the Master is Jesus. And how many of us can put it, try to put it back on Jesus and say, what do you mean? What do you mean I have to do this? Or what do, I mean, what do you mean I have to follow this? We can try to put it back on Him and use the same tactic that Satan does in manipulating our situation. The one-talent man manipulated his point to where he felt that he didn't have to do anything. 
But that did not work out well for him. But look at what Satan does to Jesus. He does the same thing in guilting Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, if you'll turn there with me. Verse 4 beginning. Verse 5 beginning. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. I've gone here before, and, and I literally just look at the passage that he's quoting, Psalm 91, 11, and 12, and I recognize that if you look at verse 13, he's taken it out of context. And I've always used this to, to establish, well, there's a wrong way to use Scripture. You've heard me say that. Always take the Scriptures within context because Satan didn't. And then we move on. But look at actually what he's doing. He's using Scripture to tempt Jesus. We know that from verse 1. Jesus is being tempted and Scripture is being used to tempt. But look at the manipulation that Satan is doing with the Scripture to strive to tempt Jesus. What are the two things he says, if you are the Son of God? So he's challenging his lordship. He's challenging whether he is deity. He says, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. Then he uses Scripture, for it's written, the angels will catch you. So if you really are the Son of God, then there's no problem in you being thrown down. You'll be caught. But if you are the Son of God, also they're going to catch you. So he is challenging Jesus. He's guilting Jesus concerning his deity and concerning the Scriptures. So if you are true and the Word is true, then you should throw yourself down. He's manipulating Jesus. And you think about it, if Jesus gave in to the manipulation and the angels don't catch Him, He dies before His time. And He didn't become the sacrifice for mankind. So look at what's on the line. Again, it's the salvation of all people in both Genesis 3 and in Matthew chapter 4. And it was Satan manipulating using guilt. So yes, guilt is from God when it's taken like a verb. When I, if, if I were to attempt to guilt someone, I'm trying to get my way. If you attempt to guilt someone, make someone feel bad so that you can get your way, that is, that's the oldest trip, trick in the book. That's what Satan did in the beginning. And so, the guilt cannot be used as a verb. Guilt is a result, therefore it's a noun. Guilt is a result. So we've, we've got to stop and recognize that guilt has its place. In the same way that Satan can use guilt and to, to manipulate, just like he can use the word to manipulate, we don't need to demonize, literally, the word guilt. We don't, just like we don't demonize Scripture. Just because Satan used Scripture, we haven't demonized Scripture. We've just learned that we need to use Scripture in the right way. We can't demonize guilt. We've got to recognize guilt in its right way. Because guilt is also from God as a motivator. Guilt is also from God as a motivator. If you will, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as was read for us by David. If you look at verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Tonight, we're going to look at what the therefore is therefore as the continuation. But let's stop at verse 11 and just see, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. All right, so we know the fear of the Lord is what Paul's saying. And what we are is known to God. Therefore, he's saying we're God fearers. And God knows that we, we fear him. And then it says, I hope it is known, I hope what we are, being God fears, is known also to your conscience. So, when, when we recognize someone who fears God, what will the fear of God do to your conscience and to my conscience? Well, if I'm outside of God, if I'm outside of His grace, if, if I'm outside of His law, then it will cause guilt. And we know that just two chapters later in chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, for godly grief 
Another word for that would be guilt. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. It's a salvation without regret. A salvation without guilt. Because guilt is gone. So again, godly grief has its place. It produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So, so often we have looked at grief and said, well, it's from Satan. Yes, worldly grief is from Satan. But godly grief, godly guilt is straight from Him. And in fact, it's a motivator not for us to stay in guilt. We were not intended to live in guilt. No one is intended to just live with guilt all the time. It's an indicator. Just like when I'm hungry, my stomach has a built-in mechanism to tell me, why are you not eating? My stomach tells me, go eat. In the same way, guilt is telling me something that needs to be done. Something needs to change as long as my conscience is being fed by God's Word. As long as it's godly grief and not worldly grief. Again, recognize where the standard is. If Satan can use guilt to get his way, maybe the the grief and the guilt that you're feeling is from Satan and not from God. That's where study comes in. That's where making sure that we're, we're, we're rightly handling the word of truth and not taking passages out of their context or, or using, using others to, to, to feel guilty, but use others as a motivator. Just like we heard this morning uh, from Brother Jack, and what he had to say concerning the example of others that can help us. So, but when we recognize grief as a motivator, we immediately see it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. And this is a passage we've gone to quite a lot as far as, as understanding the church is being established here on the day of Pentecost. And the audience heard in Acts 2.36 by Peter, he said, let all the house of Israel know for certain that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? You see, they were cut to the heart. That is guilt. Because they knew for certain, based on how they were hearing in their own native tongue, the sound of the mighty rushing wind that brought them all together. We read that earlier on in chapter 2. And when we recognize that they, they understood through the mighty works that Jesus had committed, had, had performed it, they had committed Him into the hands of the Romans and that He was crucified just 50 days prior. When they heard all of this, they were cut to the heart. That's guilt. So that's good. Because Peter didn't respond, oh no, 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 guilt's from Satan. You don't need to feel bad. That was not the response. But this was godly grief. And it produced a question. What shall we do? In the same way, it was the result of hearing the Spirit. The result of hearing the Word proclaimed they felt convicted. They felt guilt. And in fact, John 16, 7-8, we've gone to this a lot as well and recognize it was the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's good that I go away, for if I do not, I will not send the Comforter. And what does it say, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit when I think of comforter, I, I think about that, you know, that, that warm, cuffy, uh, comfy comforter on the top of my, my bed. I, I think about, ah, oh, just comfort. But what he says about the comforter is that he will convict the world concerning sin. Wait a minute. I don't want to be convicted concerning sin. That's not comfortable. I want to be comfortable in my, in my sin. Well, we usually say it's in my skin, but it still fits. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Verse 12 goes on and says that He would guide the apostles into all truth. That's why we have the Scriptures. And when we hear what, the, what is said within its context and we are pricked in the heart, there's a reason. It's literally saying, why are you living this way? Are you willing to make a change? You are starving yourself spiritually. 
Guilt has its place. But again, it is the result of the Spirit, not the result of you and me. But so often we want to make sure that people obey the Gospel and so we will just take it and we'll just cram it down people's throats. We will bash them over the head with the Bible and we will use it and it almost like it comes from our authority, not from Scripture. So often people have responded to what has been said and say, are you telling me? No. My response every single time is the Scriptures say it. Just like Jesus responded, it is written to Satan. We just look at what does the Bible say? It is written. So in the third place, we recognize that love replaces our guilt. So what we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is that guilt has its place. That We recognize that it persuades men. The fear of the Lord persuades men. But if we look at verse 14, it says, for the love of Christ controls us or compels us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. So we recognize it is the fear of God that persuades man, but it is the love of Christ that keeps man. Guilt had its place, but it was never intended to remain. Guilt is gone when we respond to what the Scriptures say. When they asked on the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? We, we understand that Peter responded, repent. What did we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10? Godly sorrow produces repentance. Guilt has, is the mechanism to help us overcome. Yeah, I, there was a preacher in Ohio that was a very close friend of mine. He died at, at 91 years old. And uh, in fact, he stormed the beaches at uh, Guadalcanal, in fact, and, and, uh, and had lived a, an incredible life. And when he talked to me, this is what he said. He said, you know, there are a lot of questions about heaven that I do not know. He said, but I don't have to know them. I don't even have to know that there is a heaven. He said, because just, just to be frank with you, I don't want to go to hell. And he said, and that's enough for me. Wow. There's a generation that heard that a lot. Right? Is that, is that a fair statement? Generation that heard, you've got to repent or you go to hell. But there's also a generation that heard none of it. Because so often we've reacted and not heard the concept of love. But we've got to find the balance in the middle and recognize that hell does exist and it is a motivator, but heaven exists and is a beautiful motivation. It's where salvation resides. It's where those who have salvation reside. That's why Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He said, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise of is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. And with many other words, He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received His word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Those 3,000, did they feel the guilt anymore? Did they feel the cut to the heart anymore? That cut, that wound healed over that day. They felt guilt for maybe a few hours. Guilt was never intended for them to feel forever. Let's keep that in mind. And again, what we sang right before our lesson with the greatest commands, if we look at 1 John chapter 4 and we look at, at this concept of God is love, we could look at verse 7 and that's what we sang but look at verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. So they no longer were abiding in sin. They were abiding in love. They were abiding in God. By this is love perfected, verse 17, with, with us, so that we may have 
confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Notice we, see, we saw before that godly fear produces, the, the, the concept of, of godly grief produced repentance. But the, the concept there in, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, the fear of God persuaded men, but it was, well, we've got to see that the, this love is replacing that concept. We still respect, we still understand, but we, we stay in God. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Verse 19, we love because He first loved us. God loved you enough to send His Son to die for you. So that the guilt that you feel because of sin doesn't have to remain. But we've got to make sure that we get rid of guilt concerning the, how God prescribed. There are some people who say, well, guilt is man-made. If you say that guilt's man-made, then you can just say, well, it doesn't matter then. If it's man-made, I don't need it, and I can just push it aside, and I can do whatever I want to do. That will ruin your life. Because guilt is not man-made. I believe that was created by Satan. Satan then uses guilt, but God can also use it to bring about godly sorrow. It brings about repentance. If you're willing to do that this morning, we have an invitation so that you don't have to live in guilt any longer. And if your guilt is based on something that you're doing outside of God's Spirit, then it's based on the flesh, and that's what we're going to be discussing tonight. That has to be remedied. Well, does that mean that I need to be rebaptized? If you will, let's look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. I realize our time is quickly getting away from us. This is, this is the, the next time that Luke records that Peter speaks there in Solomon's portico. And in verse 18, it says, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that His Christ would suffer, He has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is a parallel to Acts 2.38. So we recognize that the times of refreshing is that concept of a continual refreshing, but we need to continually make sure that sin doesn't stay within our members, stay within our lives. Are you willing to repent of sin that may have crept back into your life, you can have a time of refreshing. And if this invitation is for you, please come while together we stand and while we sing.